right, welcome everyone. If this is the first time that we're holding an afternoon talk in Chiang Mai time, nighttime for some of you, morning for others. It's wonderful to see people from all these different time zones pouring in. Uh, I would like to first just lay out a few basic housekeeping notes. Everyone that is not a speaker, please turn off your mic and your video. When you when we go to question and answer, we will be selecting people and reading some questions. So at that time, if you're asked to speak, to share your question, you're welcome to turn your video on. But for now, to not distract the speakers, let's give a nice non-distracting surface. Um, so today, I would like to welcome you to um, our latest talk in our um, latest speaker series that is organized by the Amur Mundi Multi-Species Ecological World Making Lab. The Amur Mundi Lab is an intersectional multidisciplinary research initiative in the global south that investigates how human and more than human world making and survival are mutually entangled. Our aim in creating this lab is to grow a knowledge making community by fostering dialogues such as these collaborations amongst disciplines spanning eco philosophy and ecological political theory, social science and humanities, arts, natural sciences, ecology, animal plant and critical life studies, geography, anthropology, uh, political and social sciences, etc. And also, uh, we hope to stimulate the production of new research, publications, workshops, curated conversations, art and science exhibitions, multi-species ethnography, and of course, innovative pedagogy through these sharings. So thank you all for coming and welcome. Um, I am the curator of, of this series and a founder of the lab. But um, let me just tell you a little bit more about the speaker series that we've created for this season. So the title, as you know, is the multi-species world making possibilities in the more than human Anthropocene. And this series is basically bringing together people from a bunch of different, different disciplines, such as social science and humanities, including scholars and scientists and artists and philosophers who are doing work on the world making practices and possibilities and challenges under the unfolding violence of the Anthropocene, Capitalocene, Plantationocene, Anthroposupremacene, extinction of scene, whatever we want to call it, in a world of multi-species entanglements. And most importantly, more than human agents that we are now beginning to take seriously coll collectively as a scholarly and a research community. In the face of this, we ask the question, how do we rethink the human, whatever that means, in a more than human world that is facing anthropogenic, capitalogenic, and ecological catastrophe? We urgently need new visions of who we are and what our place in the world as individuals or societies or as, as a species might be that will help us st stay with the trouble of the Anthropocene rather than giving up hope or fantasizing that some techno fix is going to save us. To that end, multidisciplinary research and knowledge making collaborations and visual cultural interventions offer a critical space for us to reimagine what it means to be human in a more than human ecological world of myriad other life forms who we need to survive. Thus, we need new narratives of what being and belonging entail and new visions of what it means to live a good and meaningful and fulfilling life as ecological citizens in balance with nature so that we can begin to heal the broken world of the Anthropocene. <clears throat> now, it's really wonderful that it's become much more uh, uh, much more standard to see people give land acknowledgments, but the very complex history of this place, Chiang Mai, which has such a multi-layered history of migrants and peoples from many different places uh, than, than many of the other places that we study, makes it impossible to pinpoint a single group to say, this is the traditional custodian. So rather in a multi-species spirit, we offer our sort of modified land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that this land on which we speak, work and live belongs to all earthly beings, past, present and future, including and especially many diverse indigenous peoples who came here before and made homes 
long before there were nations or states. Acknowledgements are not enough, however. We need to actively begin decolonizing our relations with the natural world and, our, and, our, and other peoples. Returning stolen lands to traditional custodians who have proven their capability and will to preserve biodiversity and landscape integrity in the lands under their stewardship is a needed first step. To borrow the words of Tuck and Yang, decolonization is not a metaphor. So I'll leave you there with that. And I'd like to just introduce our speakers. Um, so today, as you know, you've come to see a fascinating presentation by Sophie Chow, who is an environmental anthropologist and multi-species ethnographer, whose research explores the, the intersections of indigeneity, ecology, capitalism, health, and justice in the Pacific. She is currently a Discovery Early Career Researcher, award winner, a fellow lecturer in anthropology at the University of Sydney, and prior to her academic career, Sophie worked for human rights, organizations, forest people's program, supporting indigenous communities and defending their rights to land in the face of state and corporate interests. Her first book, which is gonna be presenting excerpts from today, In the Shadow of the Palms, More Than Human Becomings in West Papua, received the inaugural Duke University Press Scholars of Color First Book Award in 2021, and will be published by Duke University Press in June of 2022. We are so excited for this. Curriculum, new materials are coming. Sophie currently serves as a secretary for the Australian Anthropological Society, convener of the Australian Food Society, uh, Food Society and Culture Network, and the editorial board um, on the editorial board of cultural anthropology. Basically, she's a total badass. Um, and we are so honored to have Sophie here along with wonderful discussants who will join her after her talk. Um, in springboarding from many of the fruitful ideas into a free for all conversation and discussion that will extrapolate on, expand, extend, and discuss many of the key ideas that were brought out. Um, the discussion panel consists of, and please forgive me if I butcher your name, um, E. Nura Suryawan, who I will introduce in more depth after uh, the talk, Christine Winter, and Aria Tiwa Suryadev from our very own multi-species ecological world-making lab, who you know well because she's been playing a very big role in these speaker series all along. And finally, she gets to be actually on the stage and not just running everything. So thank you all for coming. Let's turn this over to Sophie now without further ado. She's going to give her presentation. Please do keep your mics muted and your videos off. And if you start having questions, feel free to put them into the chat and we'll deal with those during the second half of the program. Thank you and welcome, Sophie. Thank you, Maya, for that wonderful introduction. Um, can you all see my PowerPoint screen there? Yes, and the rest of us need to turn our videos off. Okay. Fantastic. Um, well, good morning. Good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Um, I'm speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation here in Australia. And I want to start by paying my respects to Gadigal elders, past, present, and emergent, and also to Gadigal kin, both human, vegetal, animal, and elemental. Uh, the lands of Gadigal, uh, like those of indigenous peoples the world over, were taken without treaty, compensation, or consent. They are lands whose stories have historically been stolen, silenced, and sanitized, but they are also lands of ongoing indigenous survivance, resurgence, and continuance. Uh, immense thank you to Maya, Aria, and the Amor Mundi Lab uh, for offering me this opportunity to share some thoughts on my forthcoming book, in the shadow of the palms. Um, I also want to extend um, heartfelt thanks and dimakasi to my dearest colleague, Christine Winter, and to Bakmura for uh, being part of this conversation as discussants. And of course, thank all of you uh, for making time out of your mornings, afternoons, and evenings uh, to be part of this discussion. 
So uh, In the Shadow of the Palms draws on long-term ethnographic fieldwork that I conducted in the Indonesian-controlled region of West Papua, first in the capacity of project officer for the Indigenous Rights Organization Forest People's Program, and subsequently in the capacity of doctoral and postdoctoral researcher. As Maya noted, uh, the book engages with a number of intersecting themes, including ecology, capitalism, indigeneity, violence, and justice, all within the broader context of a pro 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 proliferating plantation frontier that is radically reconfiguring the multi-species life worlds of indigenous Papuan peoples. So what I want to do in the talk um, is first of all, flesh out for you the ethnographic setting where this story unfolds. And then I'll focus on what the book itself explores how this book came into being and what insights it can offer for understanding processes of extraction, extinction and emergence on the Papuan plantation frontier. Processes that are, of course, themselves embedded within and symptomatic of a broader epoch of planetary unmaking. So I'm taking you traveling for the next 45 minutes or so to the Regency of Maroke, uh, where the red dot is on the map here. Um, Maroke is located at the southern tip of the Indonesian controlled region of West Papua, which sits on the western half of the island of New Guinea. This lowland region is composed of peatlands, grasslands, and dense swamp forests. In the inland back plains, serpentine rivers heave to the cadence of monsoonal rains giving rise seasonally to Papua's most extensive wetlands. A range of resident and migratory birds, waterfowl and waders inhabit this biodiverse zone, whilst larger mammals such as cassowaries, tree kangaroos, possums and crocodiles populate its forests and rivers. The villages of Ralayam, Bayao and Nirav where I undertook my fieldwork in Maroke, uh, are three of eight settlements that lie along the upper reaches of the Bian River in Maroke's inland subdistricts of Ulilin and Mutini. These villages sit in turn within the customary territories of the Marind people, and they're home to around 600 households who self-identify as Marindian, or Marind of the Bian River, or as Marindeg, uh, Marind of the Forest. So these communities um, derive their subsistence primarily from hunting, fishing, and gathering in local forests, swamps, and mangroves. And Marind um, communities um, are divided into a number of different clans that are each related to a group of forest species whom they refer to as their grandparents, Amai, or as their siblings, Namek, and with whom these different Marind clans share common descent from ancestral creator spirits, or Dema who drew animals, plants, and humans out of fissures at the earth at the beginning of time. The interactions of these plants and animals and their human kin are anchored in principles of exchange and care. So plants and animals grow to support their human counterparts by providing them with food and other resources. And in return, humans exercise respect and perform rituals as they encounter their plant and animal kin in the forest, recall their stories, hunt, gather and consume them. And it is these reciprocal acts of nurture and nourishment that enable humans and other than humans to participate in a shared community of life within the eco-cosmology of the forest. Since 2008, however, Marind and the Upper Bian have seen vast swaths of their customary lands and forests targeted for conversion to industrial plantations under the so-called Miralke Integrated Food and Energy Estate, or MIFE. MIFE is a $5 billion agribusiness scheme that was initiated by the government and that's intended to promote uh, the country's self-sufficiency in basic foodstuffs. The image I'm showing you here uh, is a piece of drone footage uh, that I took back in 2015 when I started my field work. Um, and that sort of gives you somewhat of a sense of the scale of the land conversions that are happening on the ground. By 2011, uh, when I first visited rural Maroke, the government had allocated some 2 million hectares of land to 36 corporations, both national and international, for the development of oil palm, timber, and sugarcane plantations. Vast areas of Marin's forests had been felled or burned. Major watercourses had been diverted to irrigate the newly established monocrops. 
Many villages along the river of the Upper Bian were already encircled by plantations that covered several hundred thousand hectares of former forest and that extended north into the neighboring district of Bukendigul. Ranging from 20,000 to 300,000 hectares each, plantations today creep right up to the edge of Marin's villages, encroaching on sago groves, hunting zones, and sacred graveyards and ceremonial sites. As we enter the third decade of the third millennium, dozens more companies are applying for operational permits. Agribusiness continues to expand relentlessly across the region. So I first visited the Upper Bian region of Meroki in 2011, when I was working as a project officer for the UK-based indigenous rights organization, Forest Peoples Programme. At this time, uh, I was undertaking field investigations with local NGOs and church institutions to document the social and environmental impacts of local oil palm developments. These investigations revealed that oil palm projects were being designed and implemented without the free prior or informed consent of indigenous Marines. Military corporate collusion was rampant. Consultations, when undertaken, tended to present these projects as a fait accompli and offer limited information to communities on the potential risks to their food security, land rights, and economic livelihoods. All palm projects were also often framed in gov government and corporate discourse as key to national interests, regional economic growth, and the development for Mangunan of Papuans into modern civilized subjects. Yet employment opportunities for local communities proved limited, as many of these companies often brought in their own labor force from elsewhere or hired migrants. In this regard, Regard then, uh, oil palm developments in Merauke exemplify vividly what anthropologists have called the dispossessory dynamics of agribusiness expansion, a process premised upon and perpetuating structural violence in the form of land alienation, growing poverty, intergenerational displacement, and precarious rural livelihoods. The expansion of these plantations also represented a classic case of land grabbing or the large scale acquisition of land in the global south for agricultural development intensified by the food, fuel and finance crisis of 2008. In these regards, the dispossessory dynamics of agribusiness expansion in Merauke were not radically dissimilar to what I had witnessed in other parts of the Indonesian archipelago, particularly in Sumatra and Kalimantan or Borneo. But the particular ways in which this dispossession was being experienced by people on the ground differed. Very early on in my field work, I was struck by how Marin conceptualized the arrival of oil palm into their lands. The stories that I heard in the field were not about global markets, corporate interests, or food security, nor did they revolve primarily around the issue of rights, land, human, or indigenous. Instead, cryptic statement abounded in villagers' reflections on their present condition, which were invariably preceded by the temporal marker since all palm arrived to the Lasawidatam. All palm, people would tell me, was a modern totem that had made time come to a stop. The forest had become a world of straight lines, haunted by a rapacious and foreign plant being. Cassowaries and crocodiles were turning into plastic and weeping like humans as their native habitats disappeared. At night, all palm depleted the flesh and fluids of dreamers in their sleep. Meanwhile, the skin of animals and plants was drying out as all palm sapped wetness from the earth and devoured the forest. These narratives challenged my activist habitus. They also stimulated my curiosity. Eventually, they brought me to leave the world of human rights advocacy and to undertake long-term ethnographic fieldwork among the wind. These early experiences thus in many ways marked the beginning of a long personal and intellectual journey of encounter with difference, a difference whose many facets I explore in the chapters of the book. Opan expansion, I came to realize, could not be framed as either a social or an ecological problem, nor could it be addressed purely through the discourse of human rights or environmental justice. This expansion was radically transforming Marin's sense of place, time, and personhood, their bodies, stories, even their dreams. It affected men, women, and children, both present and to come, who, together with their forest kin, appeared to be undergoing a more-than-human existential crisis, 
one that left no single sphere or species of life untouched. NGOs, including the one I worked for, targeted the government, corporations, and financial investors in our anti oil palm campaigns. And yet the communities whose rights we advocated seemed far more interested in oil palm itself, where it comes from, what it wants, how it differs from native species, and why it is so destructive. Against this backdrop, um, In the Shadow of the Palms uh, focuses really on how Indigenous Marind, in an out-of-the-way place, engage with the disruptive effects of an other-than-human actor. Specifically, the book asks, how do Marind experience, conceptualize, and contest the social and environmental transformations provoked by deforestation and oil palm expansion? How do these transformations reconfigure the relations of Marind to each other, to other species, and to the environment? And how do plant human dynamics in the Papuan agribusiness nexus inform our understanding of multi species entanglements in an age of planetary unraveling? What I try to demonstrate in the book is that in order to appreciate how all palm transforms the interspecies relations, geographies, and temporalities of rural Merauke, we must take seriously, as Marind do, the attributes of plants as particular kinds of agents. Villagers whom I worked with and learned from do not conceptualize oil palm only as a sessile object of human exploitation or as a passive instrument of capitalist gain. Rather, widespread speculation over oil palm's affects and effects arise from the fact that the plant itself is seen as a willful entity, one that is voracious and destructive, but also subject to the violence of techno-capitalist regime. In the proliferated being of oil palm, then, the forces of neoliberal capitalism and settler colonization resist conceptual extraction and instead find material grip. And yet, as I show in the book, uh, the blame that Marind uh, placed on oil palm for its destructive effects is only one part of a bigger story. As much as they resent the plant for its destructive impacts, Marind also pity the plant for its own subjection to totalizing human control. Others express curiosity about oil palm's origins, needs, and desires. Ambivalent affects and heterogeneous perspectives coalesce around this alien plant of unknown ways and wants. So in this light, taking seriously the conflicting meanings of oil palm from Marind brings us to ask which lives and deaths matter within capitalist natures, to whom and why. It invites attention to justices alternately enabled or preempted by agro-industrial landscapes. It also reveals the potential and limits of the species as a mode of analysis, relation, and practice. And it points to violence itself as a multi-species act, one in which humans are not always the perpetrators and non-humans not always the victims. So let me take you through um, the various uh, facets of this transforming life world that the book explores. So I begin by exploring the making of the landscape in the Upper Bian. As they travel through their environments, Marind retrace the paths of their predecessors and create relations with each other and with non-human organisms encountered along the way. It is these intersecting roots that give rise to Marind's sense of rootedness within the forest as an animate realm, co-created with diverse other than human life forms. Today, however, this dynamic sentient landscape is subject to the force of a network of state and corporate nodes of control, from roads to military garrisons and oil palm plantations, all of which exert ambivalence force on Marind and their forest kin by enabling certain kinds of movement, whilst also interrupting the flow of organisms that is said to enliven the forest. The ambiguous effects of these changing topographies resurfaces in a different guise in the context of mapping, a deeply contested representational practice that I explore in the second chapter of the book. Many Marind whom I worked with are very critical of government maps and what they call their unnaturally straight lines because these epitomize the totalizing control of the state over the landscape and its inhabitants. Some of my interlocutors also disapprove of drone mapping technology or what some Marind called plastic bird mapping because like the state, Drones impose a top-down but lifeless perspective upon space. In contrast, Marin produce their own living maps of the forest that are shaped by the sounds and movements of forest beings and their in-place relationship to humans, both past and present. 
producing these dynamic cartographies and um, these maps that won't sit still in Marin parlance constitutes a form of resistance on the part of Marin to the state's hegemonic and stabilizing gaze. However, the dynamism also undermines in many cases the legitimacy of community maps in the context of their land rights advocacy. Many Marin are also torn about who, over whose perspective, participation and perception matters in the production of accurate and effective spatial representations. And these questions surrounding perspective, participation and perception are in turn fundamentally linked to the ways in which Marin understand personhood itself as a malleable and more than human attribute. So in several sections of the book, um, I explore uh, the ways in which Marin understand personhood, particularly through idioms of skin and wetness, which to Marin constitute physical expressions um, of both human and other than human beings, social and moral standing. Glossy skins and wet bodies are said to communicate Marin's capacity to become human or anim through their reciprocal exchanges of fluids with species and elements of the forests from plants and animals to rivers and soils. In contrast, the poor or deteriorating condition of bodily skin and wetness indicate an imbalance in social relations, one that is now being aggravated by the expansion of monocrops and their noxious chemical atmospheres. At the same time, the porosity and permeability of more than human bodies produced through these interspecies exchanges of skin and wetness sometimes places humans at risk of perspectival capture by forest beings. Moving from the forest back to the village, um, the book explores the ways in which the expansion of plantations is giving rise to new and often quite ambiguous more than human relations in the village. So um, with agribusiness projects uh, expanding relentlessly, uh, a growing number of animals are now approaching marine settlements in search of shelter and subsistence. Uh, the image here is one of a young cassowary uh, that approached uh, one of the three villages where I conducted my field work and that has been sort of taken in as a pet uh, as a result of the loss of its native habitat. And yet what I uh, discovered during this my field work was that Marinda were deeply conflicted about how they should interact with uh, creatures that they often describe as orphans or refugees. Many of my companions pitied animals like the young cassowary on this picture here um, because they are said to have lost their wildness and freedom and also to behave like non papuan settlers, the way they eat rice and take baths in plastic buckets. Uh, and this transformation of wild animals to tamed domesticates is in turn troubling for Marind who relate uh, to these experiences through their own um, political oppression and ethnic domination as coerced citizens of the Indonesian states. Uh, many of my companions also noted that um, these animals uh, appear to enjoy living in settlements and some refuse to return to the wild. Uh, and many would once again establish an indexical relationship uh, between uh, the desires of these domesticates and the promissory lure of modernity um, and sedentarization that is also reshaping Marin's own social dynamics and uh, organization. So in many ways, domesticates are provoking anxiety for Marin because they offer a somewhat all too faithful reflection of the ambiguous condition of their human keepers. The book then takes the reader traveling back from the space of the village to the realm of the forest to explore the intimate relations between Marind peoples and the Sago palm. Here, I follow Marind in the practice of Pigi Kanal Sagu, or going to know Sago. This is a practice that, that encompasses a whole range of activities through which villagers affirm their social ties to each other and also attune to the multi-species life world of Sago and its diverse symbiotes by immersing themselves in the sounds, sights, and smells of the grove, Marind rediscovered the storied life ways of both sago palms and their intersections with those of humans and other organisms across time and space. The sago grove is also a gender-inflected realm where women celebrate their roles as mothers based on affinities between their life-giving forms and fluids and those of the sago palm. Together, these physical, sensory, and affected dimensions of being in the grove are what endow sago pith, or flower, with its distinctive social taste. Eating and knowing sago are also politically imbued acts through which Marind affirm their identity as sago people, 
often in counterpoint to non-Papuans as rice people um, and to the colonial capitalist regimes that foreign beings and foreign food incarnate. The story lifeways of Sago Palms and Sago Groves Sago Groves uh, stands in marked contrast to that of oil palm and oil palm plantations. While Sago sustains the multi-species life world of the forest, oil palm is said by many marine to refuse relations with both them and the diverse non-human organisms who, whose life ways the plant destroys. The plant is often described as alien and invasive. It pursues a solitary existence and devours land and water to further its proliferation. In the image of its own self-interested disposition, Opam is also said to breed fragmentation and conflict within marine communities over matters of land rights and compensation. So Sago palms and oil palms very much emerge as two radically opposed extremes within an effectively and politically charged moral vegetal spectrum. And yet this seemingly stark counterpoint is complicated by the fact that Marind also pity Opam for its own subjection to totalizing forms of human control. And many villagers are express a deep seated curiosity about all palms, mysterious and largely unknown origins, needs, and life ways. So this is a plant that is imbued with a kind of ontic opacity. Um, and this ontic opacity, this mysteriousness, is also what intensifies its speculative affordances as an object of wonder. In the final two sections of the book, um, I turn to marine theories and experiences of time and of dreaming. And here I center my analysis on a prevalent statement amongst Marind, and uh, namely that since all palm arrived, time has come to a stop. So in the book, I outline the various episodic disruptions that have shaped Marin's sense of historicity, uh, and I explore the ways in which the time-stopping effects of the oil palm arise both from the plant's regimented and controlled modality of growth in the plantation, its association with the future-oriented linear temporality of capitalist modernity, and also its enlistment in the nation-building visions of progress and development of the Indonesian state. This is a plant that imposes a sort of monotemporal growth on formerly polytemporal forest ecosystems. In doing so, oil palm obliterates the spatially experienced past of humans and other than human beings in ways that then foresaw the possibility of a meaningful present and also thwarts the shared futures of the forest's dwindling community of life. In the final chapter of the book, I explore dreaming. And in particular, I examine a dysphoric uh, nightmare that is increasingly haunting the communities of rural Merauke, and which they describe as being eaten by all palm, the Makansawit. Um, so this dystopic mode of dreaming uh, began with the establishment of all palm plantations. Um, and in these dreams, uh, Marind uh, undergo harrowing torture uh, during their sleep. Uh, and they witness and experience their own deaths repeatedly, uh, both from their own human perspectives and from the perspectives of different forest creatures whose existence, uh, much like Marin's own, is jeopardized by agribusiness developments. In many ways, these dreams of being eaten or consumed by Orpam as a form of uh, nocturnal possession constitute amplified projections of the everyday anxieties triggered by the destructive effects of Orpam on places, persons, and time. But these doctoral experiences um, are also giving rise to new kinds of solidarities amongst the different marine peoples who are bound by their subjection to the violence of oil palm. Uh, during my time in the field, for instance, um, people were beginning to uh, you know, share their dreams together and sort of communal deliberation spaces um, in ways that revealed a, a really um, you know, interesting interpsychic dimension to dreaming as a social activity that is creating alliances between all, all palms victims, both human and other. Um, so in that sense, then, uh, dreams of being eaten by all palm have become a powerful imaginative and collective means through which Marind are unearthing hope amidst the dystopic transformations haunting both their waking and their sleeping worlds. So what sort of broader conceptual insight can we draw from uh, the granularity of Marind's radically transforming multi-species life worlds? 
Well, first of all, uh, the sites and subjects at the heart of this story, uh, I think, offer an important counterpoint to the predominantly Western and technocentric focus of post-humanist currents, including multi-species studies, the envir environment humanities, and science and technology studies. The book departs from the prevalent focus in this scholarship on scientific and conservationist perspectives, and instead grounds its analysis in the theories, experiences, and knowledges of one indigenous community whose social relations have always encompassed other than human beings, but who are now being challenged by the occupying presence of a lethal vegetal life form. In doing so, the book uh, aims to expand approaches for reimagining what is possible in more than human worlds that remain largely situated in the unmarked white space of Euro-American settler colonialism. But I think the book uh, also invites a more fundamental critique uh, of what I see as some of the central tenets of emergent post-humanist approaches. Uh, these critiques, as I flesh out in the book, include a relative lack of engagement with or acknowledgement of indigenous ontologies and epistemologies within post-humanist scholarship, uh, a limited consideration of the category of the human in the context of racializing assemblages, uh, an uncritical celebration at times of interspecies entanglements, and insufficient attention to unloving alongside unloved organisms, and also a failure to think about violence itself as a multi-species act. Um, what the book shows, what the stories and theories of Marin reveal, is that to advocate alliances with other, than spe other species indiscriminately um, runs the risk sometimes of neglecting the contrasting worldly effects of creatures of empire on the one hand and potential non-human allies on the other. And by the same token, um, to focus solely on the positive or mutualistic forms of interspecies relations can sometimes excise the emotional complexity of more than human entanglements. Instead, perhaps we need to consider critically who benefits from interspecies entanglements instead of simply or you know, only celebrating the fact of more than human mingling. In the colliding worlds of multi-species forest and monocrop plantation that I have had the privilege to enter and learn from, choices must be made about who to love and who to grieve, because beings, human and other, do pass out of existence, and life, al a life alone is not a good enough criterion of selection in deciding which worlds get to matter and which ones don't. On the one hand, then, Mer Merin themselves very much practice a post-human ethic in the way they position themselves as one kind of self amongst a plethora of agentive life forms. But Miranda are also grappling today with an other than human being, Opam, that is seen by many to be invasive and, dest and destructive. Many of the people I worked with are actively resisting the techno-capitalist assemblages, seeking to turn them into post-human cyborg cyborgs. These assemblages include the plantation economy and its production-driven logic, the dreams of modernity promoted by the government and incarnated in Opam, the racialized treatment of Papuans as primitive peoples in need of de development, the commodified foodstuffs replacing indigenous Sago-based foodways and ecologies. Together, these imposed transformations perpetuate the dispossession of Marin of their bodily and territorial sovereignty. Together, they alienate Marin from the multi-species relations that made them human in the first place. So in focusing um, on the radical ruptures uh, engendered by Opam expansion uh, in Meroki, the story of this book um, in many ways exemplifies what the anthropologist Sherry Ordner has called dark anthropology, or an anthropology that attends to social experiences of oppression and injustice in the rise of global neoliberal capitalism. At the same time, the story also engages with dark anthropology's counterpart, or what Joel Robbins has called anthropologies of the good. To this end, the stories unearth the meaning of the good life among Marind in light of their conceptions of morality, relatedness, and interspecies care. It explores how Marind resist and refuse the darkness of the present and the precarity of futures both imposed and arrested through their daily interactions with human and other than human beings, their involvement in land rights campaigns and participatory mapping, and their emergent sense of solidarity as victims of the violence of Orpam in their sleep. 
But more than anything, um, this is a story of the generative spaces that lie between the good and the dark, or what many of my Marin friends called Abu Abu. Marind of the Afrobyan area uh, often referred to 2015, which is the year that I formally started my fieldwork, as a time when the world became Abu Abu, uh, an Indonesian word that means both gray and uncertain. That year, the sky turned hazy from the smoke raised by forest burning. As the ashes of incinerated vegetation dispersed across land and sky, 1.5 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions were released from over 120,000 fires across the archipelago. The gray year was also one of severe drought caused by El Nino and aggravated by the diversion of waterways to irrigate newly established plantations. When the rains finally fell, they were brief. By then, the waters of the Bian River had turned gray from the daily discharge of toxic palm oil mill effluents. Much like gray is neither black nor white yet both, and ashes are the barely tangible remains of irretrievably incinerated forms, all palm and the future itself were very much shrouded in opacity during the year of ashes. Compensation payments and employment opportunities that had been promised to local Marin did not materialize. Instead, cheap housing popped up across the landscape to house a sudden, a sudden influx of Javanese laborers. New concession markers were erected in unexpected locations and without prior warning. Despite sustained efforts, advocacy, despite advocacy at the local and international levels were failing to slow down oil palm expansion. At the same time, rumors that oil palm plantations might be relocated to other parts of West Papua rippled through the villages. Several companies were said to have gone bankrupt, whilst others had vanished after making a fortune illegally logging the precious woods in their concessions and trading them on the international market. Whilst many of my marine companions remained staunchly opposed to oil palm, others were seeking employment within the plantations or working as middlemen for corporations. Opaque like the tenacious haze blanketing the parched landscape of the Upper Bian, oil palm itself lay at the heart of a material crisis of visibility. Here, intense concerns and curiosity were exacerbated by uncertainty surrounding the plant's own Abu Abu dispositions and desires. In rural Morocco, then, Abu Abu, or grayness, manifests in the uncertain fate of the central forest and the strange lives of village-bound cassowaries. Abu Abu shrouds the conflicting desires of Marind as they make do in a world of plastic foods and concrete totems. Abu Abu haunts the clashing temporalities of the world before and after all palm. As a conceptual analytic, Abu Abu encompasses ambiguous affects and atmospheres, things and beings, spatialities and temporalities. It is a condition of awkward existence distributed across human and non-human beings whose futures are threatened by all palm's arrival. Inhabiting this world of Abu Abu means living with uncertainty as a constitutive and generalized state of being. But Abu Abu can also generate new becomings amidst ruptured multi-species meshwork, meshworks. And in certain instances, embracing Abu Abu can also become a form of covert resistance, one that refuses the exclusions and erasures produced by fixed classificatory schemes. In this regard, then, um, In the Shadow of the Palms is not a story of feral flourishings in the ruins of capitalism, nor one of traditional ecological solutions to natural resource deple depletion. I try to resist in this book indulging in a primitivist narrative of culture death or romanticizing the realities of indigenous activism. Rather, the aim is to sort of, is to focus on how an indigenous community is learning to make do on an emerging plantation frontier one whose effects sit within a broader process of planetary undoing, and one that we are all inextricably, if unknowingly, entangled with ourselves through our daily acts of consumption. <laughs> to explain marine worlds, not to explain them away, but rather to immerse the reader in the state in a world that are at once. So before I close with some potential future directions of research that the book uh, seeks to invite, um, I want to share with you briefly how this book came into being from a more personal angle. Like the shape-shifting shape humans, animals, and plants that enliven it, 
In the Shadow of the Palm, it's very much a becoming book, both in terms of the places and people that describe, and in terms of my own changing relationship to Marind over the course of the last decade. The themes, the subjects, and the settings of this book are specific, selective, and situated, both by me and, of course, by my interlocutors in the field. This study does not seek to be comprehensive or timeless, but rather uh, it represents a necessarily partial and motivated reconstruction of the upper beyond life world. So during the 18 months that I spend, uh, spent in rural Morocco, I divided my time equally uh, across the settlements of Raloyam, Mirav, and Bayao, um, following often the movements of local inhabitants and the practicalities of weather and transport. But the greatest portion of my field work was spent not in the villages and rather in the forest, in the company of marine groups who traveled uh, to meet friends and kin, to forage and to process sago. These expeditions into the forest were crucial uh, to understanding Marin's place-making practices and their deep, intimate and ancestral relations to the forest and its diverse life forms. It was in the forest, for instance, that I was unskilled by my companions in the arts of pounding sago, sharing skin and wetness with the grove, walking and listening to the voices of bird and river. Uh, during this fieldwork, uh, and together with local church and NGO organizations, uh, I was also involved in a number of activities um, in support of Marin's land rights campaigns, both during and beyond my fieldwork. This included uh, facilitating human rights workshops in the field, offering trainings in participatory mapping, and producing a documentary uh, with my uh, companions on customary lands and livelihoods in the Upper Bia region. And this sort of ethic of engagement uh, shaped uh, the process of the research as well. Um, I involved the communities in the drafting of the human research ethic applications on the basis of which I conducted the field work. Um, we decided together on field work locations, timings and activities. We selected together also the outlets where the data would be published uh, and the form of content of the book itself, um, including what stories it would tell, in what order and why. Um, and I touch on these, engage, on these forms of engagement and co-production of knowledge uh, in various segments of the book um, to sort of highlight uh, the struggles uh, that Marin face in reclaiming their rights and aspirations before um, often uh, predatory state and corporate audiences, and also to try to bring to the fore um, the potential of engagement as a means of remaining, as a means of remaining accountable uh, for the many risks that Marin took in accepting me in their world. Um, because this was a world that was also difficult and dangerous to enter and navigate. At the time of my research, inter- and intercommunity tensions ran high. The slow violence of ecological degradation was compounded by the immediate violence of the everyday. Whilst forests were being systematically decimated to make way for all palm, over a dozen villagers had been incarcerated for opposing agribusiness developments. 22 land rights activists had died under mysterious circumstances after receiving anonymous death threats. Many more face ongoing intimidation and harass harassment from the police and military. My own fieldwork in the Upper Bian was cut short after two nuns uh, at the Franciscan nunnery in Mira village, where I would seek shelter whenever military surveillance intensified, were beaten and raped by company hired thugs. At the same time, a growing number of local landowners were ceding their lands to companies in exchange for cash, elite co-optation, bribery and inequitably distributed compensation were breeding growing conflict between Marin standing for or against Opam and the many more individuals who sat somewhere in between. In a place where the haunting force of the state, military and corporations manifests as both lawfare and lawlessness, I had to be unskilled by my Marin companions in the arts of strategic concealment and cultivated invisibility. I'm a person of French and Chinese descent. Uh, my Eurasian physique proved both an advantage and a challenge during my fieldwork. On the one hand, my Asian traits reduced my visibility in a region where the presence and activities of foreigners remain strictly monitors, monitored. On the other hand, some Marind initially regarded me as with suspicion as a potential as a possible government spy or Javanese migrant. Others voiced concerns that I was working as an undercover consultant for all palm companies because of the associations they made between my Chinese origins and the world of business. As such, my role as a foreign researcher often had to be disguised under other identities, 
both prearranged and improvised. My tool of data collection, too, had to be camouflaged. Notebooks written in Chinese and French, encrypted hard drives, and quadcopter drones made their way to and from the villages at the bottom of jute bags filled with salted fish and sago flour and set aside for me to collect from trustworthy tra traders. Meanwhile, secondhand mobile phones recorded police patrols conversations and decimated forest landscapes from inside carefully punctured cigarette boxes that we held out of passenger windows or balanced between our knees during strategically timed toilet breaks. The longer I spent in rural Meraki, the better I became at noticing and dealing with situations of potential danger, both to myself and more importantly to my hosts. My companions were the ones to instill me in recognizing undercover militia from their crooked right index finger. It never recovers from pulling the trigger, they would tell me. And to identify spies from the, scent, from the smell of scented aftershaves available only in the city. Over time, I learned to time my movements against the rounds of plantation security patrols. I learned to wait for days for cars that never arrived because their drivers had been called in for police interrogations. I gradually became accustomed to the 3 a.m. wake-up call of police truncheons banging violently on village doors. I discovered where the women and the children would retreat when drunk plantation guards staggered through the village at dusk, shooting blanks, vomiting bile, and jeering slurs at the Papuan monkeys and dogs. I learned when to be quiet or feign ignorance, how to be part of the field, and when to let go of it. To be entrusted with the responsibility, the immense responsibility of doing justice to the people who took me into their world um, at great risk um, has demanded in the book um, a certain politics of refusal, uh, one that accounts for and respects the meaningful silences and erasures that were so integral to the experience of learning from and thinking with Papuan peoples. Um, in many ways, uh, the need to sustain relations of trust with my hosts um, limited my insight to the perspectives of other relevant but potentially hostile actors, such as state and corporate representatives, the military, and non papuan settlers. Absent also from the account of this book are the stories of Marin men who are now laboring as plantation workers, of Marin women who have been ostracized by their kin for selling their bodies in the city, of local politicians and agribusiness tycoons, of malnourished infants whose lives were too brief to be either remembered or retold, of 18-year-old Javanese soldiers thrust to the farmost end of the archipelago after putting the short straw in the placement lottery. There are silences in the book surrounding wounds and breasts of women that are being burned by both pesticides and shame. And the book also doesn't um, describe in detail the perspectives of those who made my fieldwork in Meroki possible through their sponsorship, the local church and NGOs. Whilst I do touch on the role of these agents in passing, I chose not to delve into the conflicting politics at play between these institutions and Marind and out of a deep indebtedness to those who did, at the end of the day, make this research possible. Finally, um, of central importance in the crafting of this book um, and for my Papuan interlocutors was the need to find and to maintain a balance um, between ethnographic description and conceptual abstraction. During the many meetings we held uh, to discuss how the story would be told, um, my companions insisted that it was vital and um, that I impose that I avoid imposing um, upon the moving flesh of ethnography a sort of rigid carapace of scholarly theory. Instead, we tried to work towards a threading of thick description and distilled abstraction, much in the manner of the barks and filaments that my marine sisters artfully fashioned into woven sago bags. In this book, some of the concepts I deploy are marines, others are mine that draw from marines. Some concepts are inspired by the work of indigenous and critical race scholars, and others stem from what might be considered the traditional Western canon of theory. The book tries to move back and forth between theorizing ethnography and ethnographizing theory in order to collapse the hierarchical distinction between Western theory and non-Western cosmology, a distinction that itself, of course, only replicates and perpetuates the historical oppression of indigenous ways of being and thinking under colonial regimes. In switching its analysis of marine thought through Western eyes and back, the story here seeks to work against the colonization of ethnography by theory, when theory is taken to be produced by and often for the global north, based on ethnographic realities that somehow happen in the global south. 
It said the book looks for theory in small places, theory produced by people who persist in the face of imposing visibility and who have something vital to say about what it means to live under entrenched regimes of both color and capital. So this is a story that in many ways uh, is written from a place of violence, of grief and of loss, uh, but it is also a story that is written out of defiance and responsibility. The responsibility uh, in Mori scholar Linda Fuhiwai Smith's terms, not just to tell the story, but to tell the story well. Telling the story well required doing justice to the heterogeneous ways in which Marin theorized the radical transformations taking place across their lands and forests. It involved dwelling in the pervasive grayness of an Abu Abu world, both imposed and contested. It meant foregrounding the complexity of Marine's own philosophies of change and changing philosophies about worlds past, present and to come. Telling the story well has also entailed grappling with the limits of the text itself in conveying the rich and complex affective and phenomenal textures of landscapes that are at once human and multi-species oral, sonic, and even oneric, or in the realm of the dreams. To tell the story well invites attention to the challenges in tacking back and forth also between narratives of damage and defiance, of crisis and continuance, and of suffering and survivance. The challenge perhaps not of suppressing bitter stories in favor of hopeful ones, but of learning to tell better, bitter stories in an age of unmaking. In attempting to do justice to marine theories and experiences and epistemologies, the book aims to flesh out differences of all kinds as they play out among the plant, animal, and human actors of the Papuan plantation frontier, and to explore the difference that these differences make for an indigenous community in an out-of-the-way place, for an anthropology beyond the human, and for all of us who are implicated in all palms' life world as everyday consumers of palm oil and situated dwellers of a wounded planet. As a work of politically engaged anthropology, anthropology then, um, In the Shadow of the Palm, is focused primarily on socio-ecological topics, but it also seeks to foster conversations um, about the possibilities of life and the kind of work that anthropologists can do to illuminate these po possibilities in conversation with indigenous peoples as ontologists and theorists of their own changing world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was really rich and intense. And there's so many questions in my mind already coming out of that. But before we go into audience q and I'd like to introduce our round table discussants uh, that will join Sophie in a conversation. And hopefully the internet, I know there's been a couple patchy spots, but hopefully the internet will hang tough for us. Um, so, uh, Noura Suryawan lectures in the anthropology department at the University of Papua in um, West Papua. And he graduated, he studied anthropology at the BA level and then did a cultural studies master's and then went on to do a PhD in, in anthropology, writing a thesis entitled, at least in English translation, Elite Strategies for Stealing Power, the Dynamics of Regional Expansion in West Papua, and also um, did studies at the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Leiden, and postdoctoral research on cultural anthropology and dynamics of natural resources in marine communities, um, as well as now doing work on the making of local elites in West, West Papua from the 60s to the 90s. Um, and also doing research on indigenous people and national na natural resource exploitation in West Papua in collaboration with other scholars and activists. So um, Nora, you're gonna bring some really incredible local knowledge to, uh, to the conversation alongside um, the other speakers. Christine Winter is a postdoctoral research fellow with the Sydney Environment Institute and a lecturer in the Department of Government and on International Relations at the University of Sydney. Christine's research focuses on intergenerational, indigenous, environmental, climate change, and multi-species justice and their entanglements. And at the heart of her work is an examination of the incompatibilities between Western and Maori philosophies and ways in which theories of justice continue the colonial project. She's interested in creating a space for political theory to actively contribute to the decolonial project required for justice in the settler states. 
Her most recent book, Subjects of Intergenerational Justice, Indigenous Philosophy, the Environment and Relationships, is a book that sounds like it would belong on many of my course curricula. So I'm looking forward to hearing more um, about that and ideas from this research directory. Now, so many of you who've come to our speaker series are very familiar with Aria. Um, Aria is a researcher in the Amamundi Multi-Species Ecological Worldmaking Lab and also our lab manager. And she's also a graduate student of geography at Chiang Mai University. Her research focuses on human plant relations in landscapes of ruin in urban Chiang Mai and multi-species collaborative life-sustaining possibilities for justice through community supported urban cultivation practices that have transformed a garbage dump site into a thriving edible garden, securitizing food and serving marginalized migrants and urban poor in Chiang Mai. Arya is also a junior researcher on one of our lab projects on multi-species zones of contact between humans and bats in banana plantations, temples, and urban spaces in Northern Thailand, among other things. So I would like to turn the floor over to the wonderful discussion panelists, and maybe just in the order that I introduced, if you wanna throw out some ideas to get our conversation started. Once we've heard from everyone, and so we've had a chance to respond and reply, I will um, draw on some of the questions coming from the audience. Audience members, if you have a question, please pop it in the chat um, or let me know. Thank you. Let's hear from you, Nura. Can you unmute? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Maya and also Amor Mundi for having me for the uh, fantastic uh, uh, discussion and also we also glad to uh, know a SOPI uh, uh, working as a fantastic research in West Papua. And also, I am as a college, it's uh, uh, Slamat SOPI. Then uh, this is, uh, I think, the uh, uh, very important uh, for uh, uh, research uh, about the uh, communities and also the nature in, in West Papua. The contribution of the Sophie Chow books is very, uh, I think it's very uh, important. Uh, I uh, also have a, a two response and also uh, once uh, maybe the uh, reflexive uh, uh, insight uh, uh, for the SOPI book and also uh, we uh, do as a, a focus about the uh, nature and the uh, communities uh, research uh, in Pacific and also the, in, in South Asia. So uh, now in West Papua, I think uh, it's very uh, complex city sit, uh, situation. And also uh, we know uh, as a uh, rich uh, land and also uh, uh, we know is one of the different uh, uh, race and also different situation in, in Indonesia. It was West Papua is uh, a very complex city mm -hmm. and also uh, the problem is how the anthropologists and also the academia in the whole uh, perspective uh, view uh, and also uh, make a, a perspective and also uh, uh, make a accumulation uh, of the knowledge about the complex situation in, in, in West Papua. I think this is uh, it's very de debatable uh, uh, construction and also uh, discourse. And we in Indonesia and also a lot of academia in, in, uh, in all uh, country and in the world uh, have a, a, a very uh, strong contribution about the how the new col colonization now uh, having uh, in in West Papua, uh, my my first point is how the anthropologists view of, of the complex situation in in West Papua. Uh, Sopi uh, works is is very important uh, for uh, for the uh, knowledge about the how uh, we as anthropologists and also the acad academia uh, know about the nature not only uh, for uh, the cell. Yeah, uh, uh, as a, a, a economic uh, uh, um, land as a economic, uh, we know uh, when we studied about anthropology and nature, 
the land and also the relation between the communities and land and also uh, have a, pro uh, a production a lot of about the uh, value and also uh, uh, produce uh, about the relation and the stories about the land. And the, the, the second uh, point is how the uh, uh, how important is the anthropologist position in this case? For example, in, in West Papua, I think uh, the very important is how the anthropologists and also the academia, uh, they make a position uh, for the situation. I think uh, this is the loose, I think the, the, the loose aspect uh, for, for me in Indonesia and also in, in, in a discourse about the anthropologists and the nature exploitation, how the uh, an, uh, anthropology is in, important to making a position in this case. And uh, the third uh, point is, I think, uh, how the anthropologists engage uh, with the communities. I think uh, this is uh, the, the very uh, uh, debatable also uh, discourse and how we know a lot of anthropologists in, in, in this country, in the Indonesian country. I think it makes a, a Papuan uh, people as a, a object. It's not, uh, uh, they don't uh, uh, view and also make a, a perspective how the Papuan people is uh, struggling uh, their uh, sovereignty and also their uh, resistance uh, about the uh, relation between uh, the people in, in, in the state. And, uh, and uh, uh, my fourth uh, point is uh, maybe we uh, think again about the how uh, the people in West Papua is uh, they have a strategic is not being governed uh, by the by the people by by the government and also I think by the army and also the uh, security here and also uh, they uh, have uh, the people uh, they have a capacity uh, they have capacity to uh, defend new forms of society in I think in uh, uh, contemporary uh, struggle I think it's, uh, I. Uh, have an uh, insight from the James Scott uh, works, maybe about the two chairs for an anarchism, to look uh, not uh, uh, only the, the West Papua as an object. They also uh, have uh, belief and the possibilities of the autonomy. They have a self-organization and also they recognize among the uh, other things and I think uh, they uh, have uh, political thinkers uh, in in the in the communities. I think uh, this is uh, important uh, point. I think to look uh, the situation in West Papua and Sopi works uh, is very insightful uh, as as always and a very prolific uh, researcher and 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 writers and also we in in West Papua and also Indonesia. Uh, is a very a strong contribution to know and uh, study deeper about the uh, how the local uh, communities and also uh, especially the Papuan people uh, make a, uh, make a contribution and also make a, a political system uh, in in their community and also they have a struggling for the uh, situation is very complex cities in West Papua. I think uh, that's um, my my very uh, up a brief uh, uh, response, uh, Maya, uh, for the uh, uh, SOPI uh, uh, presentation and also uh, uh, for coming uh, SOPI uh, books. Thank you. Do you want to respond to that, SOPI? Sure. I'm happy to respond to that. Um, thank you so much um, for those four, five um, really thought-provoking questions, Umura. Um, I'm going to try and address them as best I can. Um, yes, I think the question of the complexity of the situation in West Papua, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an incredibly, um, fragmented, uh, conflicted sort of political, societal sort of terrain. 
Um, I think uh, the scholarship in anthropology, at least that produced by you know non-Indonesia-based scholars, um, has 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 centered a lot on this sort of you know the political uh, volatility and, and violence that 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 has you know shaped the the, the, the landscape of Papua for, for over sixty years now. Um, but what I what I really um, came to understand through long-term immersion in, in, in the marine uh, life world is that the political is, is never just human. Um, politics is biopolitics in the sense that plants and animals and uh, weather and rocks and rivers are also political agents and protagonists. Um, and you know, once we start thinking about the political or struggle over power um, in both human and more than human terms, and then we start to rethink justice also in more than human terms, uh, dignity in more than human terms. And here I'm, I'm uh, touching on, on Christine, Christine's work on, on dignity. Um, it sort of offers a, a really more capacious way of thinking about sovereignty and autonomy and, 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 and relationships, I suppose, um, in ways that encompass, of course, the sort of uh, you know, racial and ethnic dimensions of the Papuan, you know, landscape, but also accounts for the role of other than human beings also as consequential world makers, and in the case of Opa, possibly world unmakers. Um, I, I, I completely, um, I, I really appreciate the point about, um, yeah, sort of decolonial research, um, whether or not there are possibilities for that within anthropology, or whether the discipline is incorrigibly colonial from the outset, um, one thing that certainly, uh, you know, stayed with me throughout the whole of my research in Papua was, was the moral hazard, right? I'm a foreigner, um, I live outside of Indonesia, uh, it was uh, really, really important for me to be always certain that my presence in the field and uh, my questions and my activities uh, didn't lead to negative reprisals or repercussions on the people who you know entrusted me with their time and their space and their knowledge and their wisdom and their science um so you know that avoiding the moral hazard of, of taking risks when you are not going to be the one to bear the consequences was was really important and i and i and i hope i've done it um, as well i can uh, but it's something that i think as anthropologists, um, yeah, we need, we need to write about it. We need to write about the non-innocence of ethnographic uh, knowledge production. We need to write about, um, you need, we, need to write, we need a hesitant anthropology that doesn't take for granted, um, you know, our positionality and our power, our privilege, um, and using our as a foreign, non-Indonesian, non-Indigenous anthropologist. Um, and writing about it is not enough. Um, decolonization needs a hell of a lot more than writing about it. But I think uh, beginning by avowing of the non-innocence of research um, is, 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 is nonetheless important. Um, and I finally, I want to touch on questions of resistance and, and um, community organizing and, and you know, advocacy movements. Yes, I mean, that's a big part of the story in, in Moroki and also, of course, in Papua more generally. Um, you know, the people that I worked with are involved in local, national, even transnational land rights campaigns and advocacy and um, happening both in national courts and through international UN mechanisms and you know appeals and complaints submitted to UN rapporteurs and so forth. Um, these efforts have actually often led to an intensification of military surveillance and control on the ground and um, that people are persisting with these struggles and they're working with an array of uh, national and transnational organizations, NGOs, humanitarian very much part of the story um, but one thing that certainly came to the fore um, during my time in Maroki is that there's also a deeply gendered dimension to resistance and activism in a place like Papua so the mama mama the woman um, you know often they don't they don't have a say um, they don't get a seat at the table and um, they're not part of the mushawara the, the, the deliberations right um, so there, there were many grievances also being expressed by women who feel that you know, their, their marginalization and exclusion from the nation state is, is kind of compounded by their marginalization and silencing within the sort of customary decision-making structures and, and processes uh, within, within Marid society itself. So again, the sort of gendered and intergenerational distinctions um, are really important to think about in, in yeah, fleshing out the complexity of the politics of, of Papua in a, in a sort of nuanced um, and, and granular way. Thank you so much, Bangura. Wonderful. Um, Christine, would you like to share some of your reflections? Oh, sure. So um, 
Thank you very much for having me. I am, um, I, I feel a wee bit like a, um, oh, I can't remember the bird, you know, the, the, the starling in the, in the nest. I am a, I'm a political theorist. What I'm doing here in an, in an anthropology talk, I have, oopsie, I have no idea. However, I am truly honoured to be here and thank you very much. Um, I've also had the um, distinct honour of having read Sophie's book um, from cover to cover. So I'm, I, you know, I'm very aware of the gifts that the book brings. And, and, and I, I use that word um, knowing that the gift is an important anthropological um, term, but also because uh, it is a gift. And it's a gift on a number of different levels. It's a number of gifts. So thank you, Sophie. Thank you very much. It has been an honor. Um, I think one of the gifts that, that, that Sophie brings, and perhaps you can talk, uh, I think you've talked a lot about this already, and that is the anthropological gift. You know, the, the gift of, helping anthropologists through thinking what a, as you say, a, um, a values driven approach to being embedded in a community where there are enormous risks um, and where the, where the, the risk is that your anthropological process, uh, your anthropological uh, process your anthropological methodology will be as extractive as those people who have come in and and created the oil palm forest so i think that's a gift and i i, I really do think it's important that if you have got time to talk a little bit more about how you approach that non-extractive anthropology the second gift i think you bring is that of, and, and this reflects my um, personal um, uh, tendencies, you, you bring the gift of sharing a complex, ongoing philosoph philosophical inquiry um, that Marin bring to sort of their everyday changing world sense making. And there are a couple of things that I think this does. One, it really exposes the really thin philosophy of the government and the corporates and possibly of the West writ large. You know, the Marin philosophy is very, very deep. The, the philosophy of the government and the corporates is, is very, very thin. It's greed, really, if we, if we want to be crude about it. So I wonder what our responsibility is as educators to provoke more philosophical thinking in our students. How do we assist them to think more deeply about the cultures that they are embedded in and the, I guess, the foundation? of culture, but also that the harms that can be done by our philosophy. Um, and I think the other gifts that come, come well, the, the other thing I think you do, and I think you do this just so incredibly cleverly, is softly, 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 and you did, and you did mention this in your talk, but in your book, you do it so subtly and so softly you catch us in the snare and you make it clear that we, as users of products in the West, are complicit in the violence that is occurring in West Papua. I think there are two questions I have around that is, you know, okay, so what can we do? And I think we can each think about that on a personal level but there's actually nothing will happen until there's something that there's some sort of bigger global structure but also talk a wee bit about the writing process the, the way that you snared us the way that you just just gently push without being without being um harsh about it 
you just gently move the reader to a point where they think, holy cow, I am actually complicit in the violence that these people are experiencing. And lastly, I'm really, really interested in what sort of international mechanisms are available for Marin to appeal. You know, how might they actually wrest some form of or some semblance of justice from the corporations and from the government? And just to conclude, I want to tell everybody who hasn't had the gift that I have had of reading this book is not only is it brilliant, brilliant, but it is an absolutely compelling read. So once it's available on the shelves, you're all just going to love it. Thank you. That was fantastic. Sophie, would you like to respond? By the way, Christine, I'm also a political theorist, so I'm very happy to have another political theorist in our conversations. And I think that it brings a wonderful dimension in. Sophie, the floor is yours. You're a little bit frozen. Are you back? We've had a little internet instability here. Are you with us still, Sophie? Can you, can you, can you hear me now? OK, we can hear something now. Your video is Hello? a little, yeah, now, now you're back. Okay. Okay, Go. awesome. Go. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, uh, Christine, for, um, yeah, every, every time we're, we're in conversation about um, this, this book, something new and different and challenging and generative comes out of it. And I just want to thank you for being so generous um, with, with your comments um, now in this space and in so many others. That I've had the chance to be in with you, uh, so I'll 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 take. I mean, that these are big questions. I mean, each of these I think I think are questions that um, you know, the question about non-extractive research and the possibility of that um, within the context of what Margaret Stewart Harawira calls knowledge capitalism, um, the story of you know, the question of the responsibility to instill. Um, you know, an appreciation of philosophy in, understood in the most capacious of ways um, as a pedagogical, you know, um, technique and this question of complicity in the non-innocence or in, impurity of, of global supply chains and everyday consumerism. Um, as you said, there are all things that I touch on in the book, uh, but that um, are all things that, you know, I, I have found most generative to, 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 to bring to the field and to transform into you know, topics of debate and discussion and deliberation with, with Marin themselves, um, who, as, as I hoped it was clear from the talk, are, are, are perfectly capable of, of theorizing not just um, the things and experiences they themselves uh, encounter in their locale, but um, who are also you know, acutely aware and cognizant of um, the sort of broader global, um, political, economic, and um, historical forces um, that continue to position indigenous peoples and bodies and landscapes, you know, as, as killable um, and exploitable. Um, so th the question of uh, non-extractive research, um, I mean, there's, there's a way that I, I certainly wouldn't claim that the research was not extractive. Um, what was really important for me was to make sure that the, uh, you know, decisions about what stories the book does tell and doesn't, uh, and whose voice um, is at the center of the story, uh, that these were decisions that I made together with the communities and, and their representatives, um, men, the women, the youth, the elders, um, the urban-based community members, the village-based community members. Um, so going back to the field multiple times after the research to, first of all, share the you know, data findings, corroborate them, um, and then decide together on what, what the book would be about um, was, was really, really important um, in that respect. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the range of activities that, you know, happened outside of the context of the scholarly knowledge production, the sort of the participatory mapping, the human rights trainings, the, the making of a documentary, the translation of petitions and complaints and court proceedings and all of that, you know, those were ways of 
those were ways of giving back, um, you know, and they were, they were very much, the, they were the minimum I could do in exchange for what I had been offered and gifted by my interlocutor. So this question of engagement um, was, was not one that I, you know, approached and so, sort of, uh, you know, like, oh, undermining your objectivity kind of angle. It was, it was the baseline. It was, it, it was the least, um, it was the minimum I could do um, in, in reciprocity for what I'd been gifted. Um, but I think there are institutional Sophie, you're frozen again. Let's give Sophie. a second. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear, hear us, Sophie? Because you've frozen again. Can you can you hear me now? All right. Now you. Great. Yeah. I'm so sorry about you know this. I'm goes? going to. I'm going to move. Closer to my modem um, because it's being no worries. Just give me no one worries. second. All good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're not migrating. One second. Connection is good. Can I sit there? The connection is not good. I have now forcefully displaced my partner from the couch. <laughs> and hopefully the connection will be better. Um, as for the question on philosophy, um, I think, yeah, I, I think a starting point um, there is um, to not assume, how can I put this, um, to, to really try to invite students to think um, much more expansively about what counts as philosophy. Um, and here, you know, we've We've discussed this before that there is often a very narrow restricted understanding of, of what philosophy is and who gets to produce it and what the canon of that philosophy should be and so I think uh, yeah really starting from the premise that philosophy is in no means bound by space or time or agent um, and more than that um, that some philosophies are actually lived and practiced um, in everyday life right and so the conceptual and the praxeological and the affective and the cultural and the spiritual um, all intermesh um, indigenous philosophies um, in ways that, you know, binary thinking and, and, and divides between what one does and what one believes or, or values, um, you know, doesn't do justice to. Um, so, yeah, inviting much more um, expansive imaginaries of what philosophy is and its relationship to practice, I think, is, is really, really key. Um, and as for the question of complicity, uh, yes, I mean, it's it's what does one do? Um, palm oil is, is, is really good to it's not good to live with for Marin, but it's definitely good to think with in the sense that, uh, you know, we are all um, in one way or another entangled with this ubiquitous, um, you know, commodity that shape shifts across our shampoos and soaps and cosmetics and French fries and ice creams and, you know, you name it, um, palm oil is in there somewhere. Um, it's also, it's a shape shifting commodity because it's often not labeled as palm oil. It goes under vegetable oil or one of some 250 different compound names. And um, so it's actually really hard to, 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 to evade or, or escape the sort of presence of, of, of this commodity. Um, but I think it's, it's important to think about, um, you know, how places and peoples and bodies, you know, the, the bodies that are paying the price for progress and for production um, in, these, in these sacrifice zones, um, like the Papuan Plantation Frontier, um, you know, coalesce and congeal in, in the stuff that we consume. Um, there are no pure ways out of these, uh, you know, regimes and capitalist systems, um, you know, broader structural changes have to happen. Um, but perhaps, um, you know, a, a reckoning and, and an avowal um, and, and a facing up to that reality of, of violence that crystallizes in, in the stuff that we consume and of which we often have far too much of um, is, is, is an important starting point um, alongside broader sort of structural reforms and transformations um, that will then need, of course, um, the, need the action of, of entities like governments and corporations uh, and NGOs and transnational organizations um, as well. Thank you, Christine. Wonderful. Uh, Aria, do you have some comments you'd like to share as well, some questions? Yes. I First, I have to say, I really appreciate this opportunity to have Sophie, Bangura, and Christine to join us. Like, I, oh, we've been waiting for this date to discuss this for many months. 
and such portion that and I even have the chance to a chapter from the book and I find like through all the the chapter you use the word my companion which I think align with what Christine pointed out of you know, explaining and telling the stories of what what you hear and which I find it the storytelling and you said earlier that there's a responsibility to tell the story well. And I think you have done such a, an amazing job to, to do this. And I, it's a very complex issue. But I also find that I can navigate through the forest, well, at least this palm oil forest with you and your companions along the way, but through the emotions and I just find that it makes me curious, like what are the other chapters? Like what about Sago? Like I read about Palm Oil, but what about Sago? What about other things in their lives and emotions? And through the presentation, the talk that you gave today, and there's the concept of Abu Abu. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk a lot about, about uncertainty, precarity, but that's also the concept of like, I feel a modernized one, but we never really hear about other ontologies to talk about it and the, but what I find and as a like a young researcher who uh, introduced about to a multi-species really recently and been growing up in the city and have very limited um, I guess interactions with uh, indigenous people until I moved to the north of Thailand that I meet indigenous people or ethnic people in the city where they have to become urbanized or at least um, certain ways, but the food they eat and the, the place I'm doing research, they're still practicing foraging and picking or growing certain vegetables that they bring from where they come from. So it makes me wonder like how, when you're in the field, after you talk about all the risk and the violence that ha happened to the people and also you as part of this, say, you know, running away from police and waking up at 3 a.m. in the morning, how do you make, like practice or be, train yourself to be, have this art of noticing or art of attention with all the things that's surrounding and happening and, you know, like, um, and also how, how do you bring such a provoking story and then bring it down to the part that we can also have, like, navigate through those complex relationships but doesn't really leave kind of like a, a hopeless feeling but more of like a curiosity like it get us curious along with the marine as companions now like okay the food I eat has palm oil and the haze we have sometimes with Thailand, Myanmar and Lao through um, banana plantations or other plantations well, is that any Abu Abu that we are also experience? Um, these are the things I also get me to start questioning. But as a researcher as well, like how, how do we practice ourselves to do this kind of multi-species ethnography? And maybe you could also share a bit of a tip or share your experience too. Thank you. And before Sophie answers, I wanted to say, because that dovetails really nicely with Marlon's comments. Marlon wrote a bunch of comments, which I'll try to synthesize, but about the question of the, the, the key issue that, that um, this kind of work raises, which is how do we actually create methodologies for making multi-species ethnography more possible to conduct or more feasible in terms of its ultimate goal of decolonized dominant anthropogenic viewpoints. And also um, Marlon asked in a different uh, chat box, um, how do we get at the ontology of non-human actors that are um, like in this more than human palm setting rather than merely illustrate them um, or non-human species in their presence uh, in relation to typical human activities? And, and how do we get at their narration of the self? Um, and, and, he, and he says, even how these human experiences could uh, do justice to the voice from a non-human species um, and not treat it like an add-on to a human experience. I think that's very con connected to what Arya is asking as well. This is, um, it's all students are always asking me, well, how do I do this kind of multi-species research? And I think you've done such a beautiful job of it. If you can share for researchers of all levels, you know, how some techniques and some tips about how to go about attuning oneself to doing this kind of work and, and also that 
the creation of the ethnographic story that decenters the human voice. It would be a wonderful gift to all of us. Speaking of gifts. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Aria, for your response, um, and also Marlon uh, through the chat room. Um, yeah, I, I'll start um, with with Abu Abu. So you know, Abu Abu for me, uh, <laughs> Abu Abu is an indigenous concept, right? Um, in this book, there was very little need to come up with a neologism or uh, to resort to you know, high theory to explain what Marin themselves were explaining through their own theoretical concepts um, and concepts that were not just abstract or conceptual, they were all around us. We were breathing Abu Abu, uh, it was in our lungs. Uh, we were taking in particulate matter of plants and animals and forests. Um, we were literally conspiring with Abu Abu, right? Um, and this double meaning of Abu Abu as, as gray and then also uncertain, opaque, um, spoke so powerfully to to the, to the world that Merwin inhabit, right? Where the line between the good and the bad, uh, the promissory and the perilous um, is, is very much in the making. Uh, people are poor against all palm, many more are uncertain. Um, hopes are being pinned on the plantation um, at the same time as the plantation is a harbinger of destruction and violence. And so I think that, that staying with staying the, the trouble of that, that, that murk, that, murk. Um, that, that sort of epistemic and ontological murk is, is really important, not just because it remains faithful to indigenous um, philosophies, uh, but also because it's a way of resisting, you know, it, it's, a, it's a form of epistemic resistance to the simplification of multi-species stories as good or bad, uh, caring or violent. And there's always so much more to the story than that. Uh, and for me, the, the complexity of ways in which Marind you know, conceptualize this world um, it, is in itself a form of resistance to the sort of simplifying uh, homogenizing reductionist logic um, of you know governing not just sort of Cartesian divides but also the plantation form itself right as a sort of mono mono culture um, of the mind of place of species and so forth um arts of noticing yes um so yeah I think Marin, Marin, Marin the injunctions I received from Marin's very early on and repeatedly um was you know to to stop writing and start walking and to stop thinking and to start listening. Uh, and that was basically, you know, leave your pen, leave your notebook, uh, start paying attention to what's around you, um, stop talking, start listening. And there are so many voices around you and they're not just human. Um, and it took me, you know, a, a shocking amount of time to actually appreciate uh, what it meant to exercise the humility of, of, of listening and not um, imposing one's voice and instead, um, you know, as Anna C puts it, to look around rather than to look ahead uh, and walking, the practice of walking, using one's body, using one's senses to really um, engage with, with, with place, um, you know, threatening places, welcoming places was really, really central um, and questions of care and justice and violence for Marind are questions that one must ask over and over again with one's body. Um, so I think your body is your body is a method, your body is a tool. Um, we just need to relearn how to use it um, in light of the many other bodies and other others and that are always you know, populating the spaces we inhabit. Um, and, and then the question of multi-species methods. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I have straightforward answers. Uh, I do agree that it's something, um, you know, my reading of, of scholarship in the environmental humanities and multi-species ethnography has been really strong on conceptual labor and sort of uh, theoretical labor, but less so on actually fleshing out the practicalities of what it means to try to think with rather than just for um, other than human beings. Um, a lot of the scholarship draws from natural history and conservation science as sort of entry points um, into, into the perceptual life worlds of, of plants and animals. Um, and, you know, at the beginning, I was tempted to go down that um, alleyway. Um, there's a whole bunch of really interesting uh, scholarship coming out now in plant science on plant cognition and plant agency and plant communication. Um, I could have gone down that way. Uh, I, I chose not to, um, because Marind, um, well, first of all, the idea of agency and cognition, communication in plants was, was nothing new um, to them, um, but also because I wanted to exercise what Susan Hardin call, calls 
hard objectivity or, or standpoint epistemology where, where you do choose um, which human stories you tell and which human eyes you read more than human worlds through and from. Uh, and in my in my case, that was through, through the eyes of indigenous women peoples. Um, you know, and it, it brings up really challenging questions, you know, about whether we can no other than human life outside of human perspectives. Um, and, and if not, which human perspectives do we choose to place at the center of our stories? And who are the experts when it comes to more than human beings, right? Um, that's a political decision as much as it is a methodological one and an ethical one. Um, but in terms of methods, again, I think I'm gonna go back to, to this idea of sensory immersion and, and paying attention um, and, and, and listening, um, listening through the body, through, through taste, through smell, um, through, through all the senses that are at our disposal um, and realizing that often, you know, plants and animals, I mean, if there's one thing climate change is teaching us is that nature does tell us things, you know, na nature is communicating very important vital messages about what we're doing um, to this planet. Um, it just it just takes us takes some listening, right? The signs are there, the, the, the communication is there. It's a question of how we're gonna respond and how we're gonna do that responsibly. Um, I just have one more question is that um, what I've learned from, um, I guess uh, what I hear from another person who's working on indigenous food in Indonesia, she mentioned about a lot of times um, government wanting to promote nutrition or better health for the people. But a lot of times they see, well, I guess it's nutrition science that promoting certain kinds of proteins, never really including sago or like indigenous plants as part of that. And what I see now um, is that, well, the word or the concept of indigenous food system also at play now with big names like FAO and many people are promoting it. But at the same time, I am also worried <laughs> what, what kind of indigenous food system we, we're actually promoting because what, what Bang Nura also mentioned is that a lot of these plantations come in the name of food security as well. And I think it doesn't really only happen in Indonesia. I, you can see that in Thailand and many parts mm -hmm. of at least in Southeast Asia. And so I, I, I guess my, this kind of idea is I would throw back to Sophie and also Bango and Christine, like uh, what we have heard and hear and dream a little bit about like how the marine people um, stay curious, I guess, with palm oil and trying to understand what's going on and looking at our food today with the instant noodles and the, mm -hmm. the world we live today how 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 like a young skull and a person like me who live in the city as well trying to adopt this mm -hmm. and and care more and opening up mm -hmm. possibility i guess I'm really happy to open the space for Mura and, and Christine to, to, to respond to that question. It's it's a really it's a it's I'm 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 working on a second book at the moment, which is all about food justice um, and relations of eating and being eaten in 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 West Papua. Um, and going back to Christine's question earlier about you know non-extractive scholarship and decolonial scholarship, that's a book that is mainly about marine women's perspectives. And they wanted a book that was about their lives uh, and their, um, you know, experiences that are often very different to that of men. And, and the book is one that, um, you know, it took a decade before the women felt they were ready for something for these stories to be told. Um, and even then half of the women don't want the book to be read yet because there's a lot of shame and stigma surrounding malnutrition and, and hunger in the villages. So this book is turning out to be, you know, half of it is about why the book matters and the second half is why it shouldn't exist and all the reasons why it matters that this book shouldn't exist. And it's the most challenging thing and the most, yeah, the most humbling exercise to have to write as much about why the stories matter as, 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 as why it's problematic that they have been written, but that's a different story. Um, I think you're right. Yeah, the, the sort of, what one thing I learned from Marind is that, you know, the, the focus on nutrition um, in, in much of food security discourse and nutritional policy um, elides so much of all the other facets that produce, um, that make nourishment possible. And, and nutrition and nourishment are, are really different things. 
And nutrition is qualitative, it's food group based, it's based on one particular understanding of the science of food. Nourishment is a much more holistic, uh, expansive, capacious, comprehensive way of thinking about the things that sustain us and that sustain other others, um, other humans, plants and animals, right? Um, it, it's, it's much more um, inclusive, I suppose. Um, and yes, we're definitely seeing similar kind of dynamics in Indonesia where, you know, indigenous forest-based foodways um, are often sort of, um, you know, discriminated against in government discourse as backward, primitive, uh, you know, nomadic. Um, the, the plant of sago itself is often said to be, you know, poor in, poor in vitamins and minerals and high in carbohydrates and so forth, um, which might be true of the sago palm, but Papuans don't eat sago on its own. They eat it with legumes and vegetables and tubers and game and fish, right? Their diet is actually incredibly diverse, um, far more diverse than, you know, some many other parts of the, you know, supposedly modernized, modernized uh, you know, developed, developed, developed world. world. Um, so I think, you know, food racism is, 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 a, big, is a big issue um, uh, and it's profoundly tied to food injustice. Uh, and of course, food injustice um, and food insecurity sits, cannot be dissociated from settler colonial, uh, you know, forms of extraction and, and, and exploitation, right? Um, Kyle Powis White has written extensively about this, right? About the ways in which settler colonization, you know, undermines the collective capacities of indigenous peoples to sustain these mutually nourishing reciprocal relations of eating and being eaten, of, of be fed, being fed and, and feeding, um, you know, humans and other than human beings. So all of these questions go back to the question of, of self-determination and, and, and of land. Um, and um, I think they, they really can't be dissociated. Um, and I do think that the, I do think nourishment um, offers a more capacious way of, of, of understanding what food means, um, how it's signified by different communities and how also how foods, you know, hungers connect us in different ways. Um, appetites of one, the appetite of one can produce the hunger of another. Um, so we are also bound through our hungers in these sort of webs of an uneven power and privilege. Yeah. So Blake has had a question for a while, I think for everyone. Blake, do you wanna ask your question? Are you still there? Okay. Hello there. Hi, sorry. Um, I, I, I wish my question was for everyone. Uh, I, I'm hoping people can respond to it, but it does relate pretty, pretty specifically to uh, Sophie's work. Um, uh, Sophie, thank you so much for presenting this. This research is fascinating. It's, it's really interesting, and I really appreciate you taking the time to present it today. Um, I'm especially interested in uh, some of the specifics, specifics of the way the, the Marind relate to uh, the, the world around them, the other species, they're, they're other than human uh, friends, neighbors, and, and cohabitants. Um, and uh, you, um, they, they seem to have a very remarkable tendency to extend uh, a sense of agency and rights to the non-human world in a way that I think is very atypical in a, you know, a Western context or, or even in just very, very many contexts. Um, you know, questions like you mentioned once in your talk, what does palm oil want? Uh, which I thought was a, a wonderful way to frame that. And um, they uh, have this ability to balance uh, their um, relation to palm oil as an entity with ages and rights. Um, you know, viewing it as a victim that is uh, of, specifically of uh, human exploitation. And at the same time, uh, not being afraid to call out its uh, Kind of a social uh, destructive capacity. Um, there was a, a, a in a small part that I was able to read. There was a person named Anna who uh, characterized the, the the oil palm as having few friends and not wanting to share space with others. And I thought that was a wonderful way to speak to a, a social relation. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my question is, and I hope this is not too far off of your research, is have you seen this commitment to an empathetic acknowledgement of agency and autonomy? Uh, of non-human species, even species that they have a problematic relationship with. Have you seen this play out in the way that Marin people uh, manage conflict and relations of authority, both within their human community and within uh, their, their more than human uh, community or their other than human community? And, and potentially even as this relates to the problems of uh, the, the social and political problem of eating and being eaten that you mentioned earlier.
Thanks so much for that response and comment, Blake, it took me a while to find you on the screen, but I think I found you. Um, yeah, <laughs> what does All Palm want? I mean, I, it really does say a lot about, um, yeah, the world would be very different if we started um, by asking that of our other than human counterparts. Um, what does it want before what do I want? Um, and it's it's intriguing. It's, um, it, as you said, brings up the question of agency and desires uh, and, and dispositions and affordances. Um, I mean, you know, many of the Papuan people that I worked with, um, you know, going back to the question of agency, um, given that they're experiencing, you know, very much a condition of what one might call omnicide, right? This, this kind of killing of everything as a result of the arrival of monocrop plantations um, in, in this, in this, under these regimes of killability, um, the very fact of being, of existing, of a plant not being dead and not dying is an act of resistance. Um, it is a resistance to the production of non-life it is a resistance to regimes that render the non-human world killable. Uh, and there's something really powerful about, about that, the simplicity of that statement that many people make um, to live in a world where, where the, just the fact of being is already a form of resisting um, because you're you know, doing that, you're, you're being in the face of these multiple intertwined processes of, of unbecoming. Um, so I, yeah, th and you're absolutely right. Um, one of the most, um, you know, Compelling and challenging uh, ways in which Marin, you know, talked about all palm um, is, is 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 this multi these multiple identities that this plant has. Um, this plant is it's uh, as I write in the book, it's not an either or. Um, it's it's a series of ands, right? It is a, a destroyer and a victim. It is a colonizer and it is colonized. Uh, it is an invader and its own his agency is is tot controlled and 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 you know. Um, done violence to by human and institutional agents, right? So this capacity to hold, um, you know, a multiplicity of, of, of ontologies of these non-human beings together in tension with one another um, it is incredibly enriching. Uh, it's incredibly complex. Uh, and once again, I think it kind of, um, it, it, it invites a practice of multiplicity that resists the simplification, the homogenization, the re reductionism um, of the plantation form and of the kind of binaries um, that, that do tend to govern, you know, or, Western ways, dominant Western ways of thinking about nature and culture, human and non-human, um, and so forth. Um, that being said, um, yeah, not all relations are good, right? Um, killing and dying and hunting um, and mourning are all part of the story as well. Um, but what what really came out from you know observing and participating in in a practice like hunting, for instance, is that um, there are all kinds of codes of uh, rituals of respect. Um, and that are part of these acts of killing, right? Um, well, first of all, you don't kill anything or rather anyone. And there are all kinds of protocols in place uh, for what animals can and can't be killed and when and how and who can do it and who cannot. Um, and and, and non-human life, non-human non death, death is something that Marin mourn, um, you know, through prayer, through incantations, through um, through through words of, of gratitude, uh, of, of acknowledgement uh, of, of the life taken. Um, so this is, you know, it brings to mind Haraway's injunction to, you know, uh, to, to not make life, what is it? To not make life, non-human life killable, right? In the sense of the need to recognize that taking a life is taking away, um, you know, a multiply inhabited, plural, lively, dynamic composite of relations um, and pasts and presents and futures. Um, so all those customary codes and rituals um, are, are, are really central to the kind of relations of living and dying that Marines see themselves as, as bound within. Um, and another really important dimension of that ethos is, is the fact that Marin talk about themselves also as, as good food for others. Um, so when you travel the forest, you're bitten by mosquitoes. Um, there are all kinds of critters like leeches, um, you know, that are after your blood. And when you rub up against uh, vegetation, your sweat is going to nourish the leaves. Um, sweat from your feet will mingle with the rivers. Um, you're going to pass on your sweat to the children who you feed, who you exchange food with, who you prepare food for. Um, so humans are not just um, the ones who eat, they're also the ones who are eaten. Um, and that's just as important. And it sort of offers a really kind of, um, yeah, egalitarian or reciprocal uh, approach to, to relationships of feeding and being fed, um, one that I think really pushes against, again, these entrenched ideas of human exceptionalism and the kind of hierarchies of worth and mattering that are you know, so central to 
dominant Western ways of, of classifying and extracting um, from you know, this putative passive nature. So we actually have a ton of comments and I know that we're coming up on uh, the hour here. We're happy to keep going for anybody who wants to stay. Um, maybe I can combine a couple of the questions that were out there. Um, I know that uh, one of them was, I think, maybe directly related to um, Magnura's uh, expertise uh, with elites, which we would like to hear about. And then there's one that's more about political theory kinds of questions that I had um, that draws from everything that I read in the chapter and also from Sophie's talk. Um, so maybe I can try to connect at least once more before we go. Typical question um, that I hope that Christine can also add to as a political theorist. So I love this concept of Abu Abu. And as I was reading this, I was like, this is really uh, a really generative concept. To think of Abu Abu as this gray space or the generative spaces between the good and the dark that are rooted in the existential reality of living with uncertainty that we all that we all inhabit and that uh, our relations with other beings whether they're other humans or other beings uh, vegetal or animal or whatever they're all fraught with complex and ambiguous valences of, of, of and, and different um, levels of entanglement that sometimes work at cross purposes with one another. It's never simply a, a black and white story. So one of the one of the ways in which I think that the that the huge resurgence and in interest in indigenous knowledges that has become a I think a hallmark of today's contemporary anthropological studies and also studies of multi species and more than human and climate crisis and mass extinction and that crisis of the Anthropocene, capitalist plantation of scene, Anthropocene supremacy, etc. Um, one of the hallmarks of that preoccupation with indigenous thought has been that the canons of the West really screwed things up um, as they became dominant ideologies that informed colonialism, extractivism, massive entitled exploitation, certain very, very um, narrow bands of, of knowing the human or very limited and, and instrumental genres of being human that Sylvia Winters called the representation of man um, that we know are highly problematic and need to be unsettled or unrooted or transformed um, if we're going to create new actionable possibilities for living and being in the world with other humans and more than human, other than human beings. Okay, so so I guess my question for Christine Christine is, um, in thinking about how we can bring indigenous knowledge systems into a, a, a more mainstream body of praxis and also conceptual tools for thinking things we can think with and also practice our our re research with, um, how do we sort of limb that divide between a sort of Instrumental appropriation, exotification, both of which we don't want to do, obviously. We don't want to fall back into like 20, or, you know, 20th century, early 20th century anthropological exotification of indigenous knowledges on the one hand that stress their otherness. We also don't want to just assimilate them into the dominant can canons and like, you know, use them as a token. You know, look, we've got this indigenous word, but we're just mapping it onto conceptual frameworks and paradigms that are fundamentally unchanged. So what a concept like Abu Abu, a generative space between the good and the dark that allows us to grapple with ambiguities and uncertainty that are, are heavily, um, that our, our relations are heavily, heavily laden with. Do you think that this kind of a concept is a concept that, let's say if I'm looking at a multi-species entanglements, uh, you know, in the Mekong or in coral reef ecologies or with humans and elephants or in other places, is there a way that, that this concept taken away from its, its own nourished local context of local knowledge and local meanings, can it be without you know, huge fineness of the concept abstracted away to talk about other similar types of gray zones, ambiguous 
complications in other circumstances that have some kinds of parallel con contextual elements. And, and both from an anthropological practice basis, Sophie, and then Christine from a political theory context, how do we think with indigenous concepts in a way that is neither exotifying nor uh, homogenizing them or appropriating them to Western frameworks? How do we do that? Because I think we need to learn how, but this is the how is the how is the what here, right? Christina, do you want to give that a go first? Um, sure. I was going to give, leave you to go first, so I think that that's fine. Um, I guess the really simple answer is with great difficulty. Um, the the longer answer, the the <clears throat> more serious answer is I think I think that our the way that we think can be expanded by becoming aware of how other people think and in becoming aware I think that it is possible that you can generate your own um your own way of thinking through your own problems now that you are aware of this other way of thinking. I, I, you, you cannot take concepts out of, out of culture. So, you know, we've been talking today, <clears throat> excuse me, we've been talking about the human and the, the more than human or the other than human entanglements. But from a Maori perspective, we've been leaving out something that is absolutely essential to this. We've been leaving out the spiritual. It just hasn't come into our conversation at all. So, you know, there are lots of uh, concepts in Maori that are very useful for us to think through um, multi-species relationships for, with, for us to think through uh, justice issues with, you know, environmental justice issues with, or intergenerational issues, uh, justice issues. But you, you, you cannot extract them from the, the totality of the knowledge system, the totality of the philosophy. And in Maori inst in the Maori um, situation, that means human, um, you know, the, li the living world or the world as it, as it were, and, and the spiritual. You can't do it. What, we what can happen within uh, an academic theory once you become cognizant of these things, is you leave openings for other ways of thinking as well. What I think is very important that theory stops doing is presuming it is universal or that it is universalizable. And so if you say something, let, let's go to the, the old chestnut individuality, you know, the concept of an individual as being the most important, um, the, the most important element of theory or of justice or of anything else is completely um, uh, inappropriate for many cultural groups. So we have to give up some of those theories, some of those ideas. It might be important within a, a liberal Western West society, but it doesn't hold in other societies. So it's the universalization that is the problem. And I think we've lost Maya. I hear she's back again. I'm here, I'm here. But yes, my connection is just cut off and then booted me back on. So yeah. sorry. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so what I just said, my conclusion, Maya, was that I think the, the, the real issue lies in one, abstracting it from its context, you know, any piece of knowledge from its context, but also the, this, this um, desire of theorists to universalize is a problem. The theory must leave open other ways of being in the world. Yeah. Thank you. I, I just want to take up um, on Christine's point about the, the perils of, 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 
of the presumption um, or the, of, of universalizing and, and universalization that so often is tethered to, to what theory is, right? Uh, and for me, there's always been something really, you know, uncannily echo, echoing between sort of, you know, the way in which theory orders and narrates uh, authors, controls, managers, realities, and the operations of the plantation itself, right? Um, so much of, you know, white academic canonical theorizing is, is a process of epistemic raking, sifting, pruning, reordering, classifying, abstracting, uh, you know, all of these terms, all of these verbs are equally applicable to the plantation form. And so plantation logic shapes not just the nature of the worlds, uh, but also how the dominant Western we represents it often through these universe, universalizing uh, concepts and theories. And um, so I think, yeah, this question of, of the situatedness and the specificity and the groundedness of um, you know, theories and concepts like Abu Abu is really, really important to bear in mind. Um, and, you know, in wherever sites um, one is doing research or seeking to learn, um, to look for those emic theories, to look for those grassroots concepts, those grassroots um, philosophies first, right, as a kind of starting point. And it's, it's not an approach that um, dominant academic um, regimes encourage, right? You do your reading, you cover your theorists, certain theorists, and then you go out and you try and prove the rhizome right, right? Um, so we need to really shift, um, you know, this relationship between ethnography and theory. Um, and part of that, I think, is as much about starting from the, the theories that are sprouting, mushrooming on in, on in the field, as it is also about taking Western theory to the field and, and getting dirty with Derrida and Deleuze. Um, because certainly for me, um, many of my intelligence, which is we're really curious about the way my part of the world understands, you know, this thing that is nature for which there is no word in Marind, um, or this thing that is culture for which there is also no word in Marind. Um, there are stories for each of the many, many components and composites that, you know, fall under these two categories. Um, so yeah, bringing, bringing theories to the field and, you know, having conversations about them, um, discussing. Um, we had some really, really fascinating conversations about the rhizome. Uh, with my Papuan friends, um, all of which involve going to the forest to actually be with a rhizome, um, because you can't talk about the rhizome without being in the presence of a rhizome. Um, and I found out that they're good to think with, but they're also really good to eat. Um, so yeah, sort of uh, leveling out or sort of, you know, moving away from that hierarchy of, of theory and ethnography um, and attending to the situatedness and groundedness of, of concepts um, and, and, and um, yeah, at the same time as sort of moving away from that sort of, yeah, tendency to to universalize theory, the human, the non-human, the plant, the crop, whatever category of analysis we're using to sort of take a step back and to wonder, first of all, what, what epistemological regimes make this particular unit of analysis the one I should focus on? Um, are there other ways of thinking than the species, for instance? How does that uh, obscure um, the consequential roles and agencies of spirits, um, of the dead, um, of ancestors and so forth, right? So constantly, reflecting on, on what assumptions we make in, in, in the categories and terms we use and, and where, they, where they stem from, I suppose, politically and historically. I would like to synthesize. There were two con uh, questions from the audience that I think would be really wonderfully answered by, by Bangura. Um, one is from Bintar um, and one is from Intan. Uh, so let me try to synthesize because there were actually like five questions there, but since we don't have time for all of them, we can also share those questions with you later to continue to discuss. Um, so Bindar is asking, uh, among other questions, what are the practical alternatives to in this sort of standard development in a place like West Papua? Um, and what kind of recommendations do you would you give to governments? Um, and, and, and if we let people living in the jungle, he says, um, if we let them continue to just keep living as they were, would it create problems um, for them in any way? And, and what kind of sort of justice can we think about in terms of land distribution um, that would make the conditions better? And then also, um, Mintana was asking, um, and I hope um, Angora can, can answer this, about the basically what the political um, specificities are of the relationship between the, the constitution and the political the political bodies with um, indigenous people's rights to land and their ability to protect their land through any kind of legal institutions from outside predatory let's say corporations or other entities 
that may have, you know, a, a kind of kickback relationship with local officials or something um, illegal or not, or using illegal means like violence, which is one of the playbooks, right, against environmental activists everywhere and indigenous people everywhere. It's just outright violence um, and intimidation. So maybe you can answer a little bit about just what the specifics are for the people here um, for so that we can get those two questions answered in more detail. Bangnura, do you, would you like to try to answer the question about the what kind of land rights and what kind of options people have, um, indigenous peoples to protect their lands and, and if they refuse development, then what are the options for them? Can they refuse? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Maya. I, I have a, a quick uh, response uh, about the question. Yes, I think uh, the situation now in West Papua is how the indigenous people, uh, uh, they also uh, have uh, the traditional uh, rule and also they have uh, a beliefs to protect uh, their, their land. So uh, I think uh, this is uh, the situation to rec uh, state and also the, the government uh, to re recognize their uh, beliefs about the uh, local uh, local belief and also in indigenous uh, theology in West Papua. And uh, as we know, uh, in West Papua, they uh, the indigenous people in the communities in in Highland and also in uh, in urban area, they also uh, have a it's like a tra traditional belief and also indigenous uh, theology. I think. Uh, uh, this uh, value is uh, until now uh, not uh, all uh, recognized uh, by the government. They also uh, want to how the uh, communities and also indigenous people um, uh, run for the modernization. And also uh, we know uh, how the uh, local uh, government and also the uh, the state government in Jakarta they also have uh, the, the program to open all investigation in 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 West in, in West Papua and also in all uh, region in Indonesia they also uh, have a, a regulation about the omnibus law to uh, inviting uh, the uh, uh, investigation in, in, in all uh, in, in nation region. I think uh, this is uh, the dangerous uh, uh, regulation and also the challenge uh, for the uh, indigenous people to uh, making uh, 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 it's like a self uh, regulation. And also I think uh, this is uh, the challenge to how the traditional and also the uh, the indigenous uh, regulation uh, makes uh, 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 indigenous people uh, they have a, a sovereignty and also they they express uh, their their relation between uh, the land and also uh, the 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 stories between uh, the uh, people uh, to the uh, uh, land. So uh, I think uh, um, the opportun opportunity, I think uh, when uh, we uh, also uh, uh, to the activists and also a collabor collaboration between the activists, ac 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 academics and also NGO in, in West Papua and also Indonesia is how the indigenous people, they also have, uh, uh, it's like a, a, a indigenous uh, regulation and as also how they uh, go front uh, their life and also uh, they uh, have uh, a contribution to um, uh, how the uh, value and also their belief about uh, about the about the land and also the the um, metaphysic world in in West Papua. Sophie I think the the work uh, of the Sophie Chow uh, makes uh, uh, the academic and also activists know about the how the uh, horizon and also the the deep uh, understanding about the uh, indigenous people in in West Papua. So uh, 
this is also the the antithesis uh, about the how the state and also the uh, Indonesian government uh, makes uh, a modernization in West Papua. Sometimes uh, the the orientation and also the temporary uh, sovereignty in West Papua and also not a compatible uh, to the modernization. That's uh, I think the the, uh, the the situation in in in, in West Papua. So uh, the uh, challenging is how now in indigenous people they also uh, have uh, a regulation and also they have. Uh, indigenous uh, regulation uh, based and their belief and also their uh, theology uh, to protect uh, their land and also protect uh, the the nature in 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 west, in, in west papua i think uh, this is the important uh, challenge now in west papua but i'm believe i believe uh, the indigenous theology and also the nature uh, relation uh, between the uh, the human and and also the land and also the nature is a, a basic uh, I think the, the basic idea and also the the, the important point as anthropologists uh, we know about uh, about that I think uh, uh, that's my point Maya thank you that's wonderful I think we are running very late but this can we do we have time for one last question or are you guys needing to bail? One more question. Pietro, you have the floor. I'm being blinded. I'm going to turn off my video. For a minute. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll try to be very quick, but I, I brought it in the chat. I was fascinated by uh, the part when you sort of mentioned the impact of the plantation that the plantation had on, on the community's dreams and, um, and sort of how it is sort of uh, uh, brought to new type of dreams, uh, but also to this form of sharing that happened uh, within the community and, and discussion around dreams and and i was wondering really how, how did this sharing happen in which context uh, was through um the form of uh, through the role of a spiritual guide or a shaman um and what were the form of uh, sort of creativity that spurred out of this or, or the form of ritual um if there was any anything like this thank you thank you so much um pietro uh, for for taking us in closing back to the to the to the space of the dream um, or the oneric. Um, so, you know, over the course of the time that I spent in, in Meroke, the 18 months of fieldwork, um, these 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 nightmares, these nightmarish experiences um, became increasingly prevalent um, across the three villages where I was working, uh, to the point that uh, you know there were moments when people were were traveling almost every day um, by canoe, by foot across the forest to go and share their experiences of, of having been eaten um, with their friends and, and with their kin in other settlements. Um, the, the fall of night um, you know, was a moment of fear for many communities um, because nobody knew who was going to be eaten and what they would experience in, 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 in these dreams. Um, and people actually started um, a new practice of, of night watching. Um, so people would stay up and, and look over the bodies of their children and their spouses and their family members. And they could read in, in the bodily movements sort of twitches and grimacings or, or, or jerky movements that this, this possession was beginning. Yeah? So something was happening to the person, the palm was beginning to sort of take hold and so they would wake them up. And then what really mattered in that moment was to ask the person their name, their origin, what is your clan? Where did you walk? What is the bird that you share kinship with? Uh, when was the last time you ate sago? Uh, remind me of the story of your ancestor, right? The idea was to bring the person back, stay with us, stay with the lands, don't, don't let yourself be, be, be captured if you wish. Um, so really, yeah, really intense, um, um, very, poignant moments um, that were you know, also very anxiogenic. And what was really interesting is that Marines have, have always had traditions of dream interpretation uh, that were traditionally undertaken by you know, um, what they call the medicine men, um, Sav Anim. Um, but what many people told me was that um, there was something different about this kind of dream interpretation, this kind of dream sharing, um, in the sense that it's new, it's different, and therefore it doesn't require an expert because no one really knows why these dreams are happening and no one really knows how to interpret them. So in a way, um, everyone gets a say in interpreting each other's dreams. It's a much more egalitarian um, system um, of, of, of reading meaning into each other's experiences, right? So there were interesting ways in which this was offering um, 
yeah, sort of forms of ritual and sharing that lay outside the ambit of traditional hierarchies of expertise and knowledge uh, between the sort of shaman medicine man figure and then the, the, the community members as sort of people whose dreams were being interpreted. Um, and what was super interesting was that, you know, for many Marines, um, you know, we think about, you know, dreaming is, a, is an individual experience, right? So most of the time we're not conscious of it. Um, and for that reason, it was, it was the sharing, the, the narrating of the dream that mattered just as much as the experience itself, right? Because there was almost a kind of healing. It was, there was something cathartic about, um, about, about telling people, you know, families, friends, what had happened and in return being gifted or entrusted with whatever trauma they had experienced. And that was forging new kinds of solidarities um, among men with women and um, youth, right? Uh, solidarities that again, um, allowed people to establish relations that would otherwise perhaps have been condoned or not allowed under existing um, you know, um, social systems of hierarchy and seniority and gendered rules and so forth, right? Um, one of my uh, sisters in the field would often say that, you know, she, she'd been in love with this man for a decade, but she wasn't allowed to marry him because he was from a clan, an enemy clan to her clan. And she told me, you know, we'll never share a life, but at least we can share our dreams with one another. And that was something, the fact that, um, you know, culture wouldn't allow them to be together, but they could still dream together and share those dreams. And that, I mean, that's, there's something really powerful about that, um, the, the way in which Marind unearths, yeah, alliances and, and hope, I suppose, um, through this shared, shared subjection to these violent dreams. Um, and I think it also sort of troubles, troubles the line between the real and the, and the non-real, the conscious and the non-conscious, um, the waking and the sleeping worlds, um, that again, perhaps brings us back to Abu Abu, and uh, that murkiness of boundaries um, between lived experience and, and dreamed experience. Um, as they are theorized and um, narrated and, and critiqued by Marines themselves, um, again, as theorists of their own worlds. Absolutely wonderful. I get the feeling we could go on for the next three hours, but I know it's very late for you there, Sophie. And um, I know this is longer than you originally signed on for, but um, really it was, it's, it's heartening to see so many people still hanging out. Um, if there are more questions that people want, go ahead and send them to us through the Amram Wendy list um, that, that subscribe to the to the email and or to the Facebook page and the, the video will go on the on our YouTube channel soon. And so those of you who couldn't uh, listen to the whole thing can go back to it or share it then. Anyway, I just want to say on behalf of Amamundi and our community here and across the world, um, thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Angura. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Aria. And um, also, of course, the people behind the scenes in the lab and Pietro and Reni and Irene and everybody. Thank you for all the amazing work that you've done to make this possible. We really appreciate this. And I hope this is the very beginning of a conversation um, and that we can have some kind of a maybe a multi species ethnography workshop uh, later on for students who want to learn how to do this uh, in the future and that we can keep this conversation going, that this is a beginning, not an end, a provocation not a definitive answer, um, but you have given us so much to think about and so much to consider, and we cannot wait for the book to come out. Um, we are so excited. So I just wanna thank you all very, very much for coming and sharing in these conversations. And I hope they can generate lots of new research and um, more conversations to come. Thank you so much. Any last comments that any uh, anyone, any of you wanna make, Sophie? or uh, any of the guests, or you wanna leave us with any thought? Only, only thank you very free. much for inviting me and for the you know, really generous space that you've created. So thank you. Thank you. All Likewise, right. I just wanna extend biggest thanks to Nura, Christine, Aria, Maya, you of course, for making these spaces possible and conversations are, are the method, I think. Um, and you know, you're, you're creating spaces for that. So thank you. Oh, we wouldn't have a conversation without something great to talk about that came out of your wonderful book and your research. So thank you all for the generosity. Thank you, audience. And see you next time. Talk soon. Thank you. Take care. Be well. Stay safe. Thank you, Maya, Aria, Christine. Keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you.